أعمالنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وصحابته أجمعين أما بعد Wednesday evening everybody's like favorite day of the week so it's uh, um, today we uh, hopefully we will keep it a little bit uh, more brief than a Friday evening session because uh, uh, yeah, like Wednesday evening my, my bedtime is like 10 so that's uh, I intend to be home and asleep by that time inshallah so I will keep it a little brief, uh, a little more brief than a typical Friday evening session, inshallah. And uh, in fact, these, uh, in particular, the topic of finding the right person is what most people have the most questions about. So um, at, at least at this stage uh, where you are still not married. So uh, I want to give ample time at the end for you to ask your questions about uh, this specific topic, inshallah. Um, and, and of course, you know, e even if we don't cover everything today in terms of uh, your questions on this topic, I'll be more than happy to answer them on Friday as well after. Um, I, I am, I'm assuming people don't have many questions about talaq anyways, so um, you know, we, will, we will have enough time on that day uh, to cover this as well, inshallah. So, um, hands up if, uh, if you have the book uh, by now, this uh, Healthy Muslim Marriage Handbook. No? Not everybody has it yet? Okay. Um, I would recommend you get it, if you're able to, because this, uh, uh, it does cover a lot, and uh, it covers it from an angle of somebody who is, who is very experienced in terms of... Uh, speaking about marriage in the Muslim community. And uh, uh, as I mentioned last week, the author is uh, uh, the teacher of uh, Mufti, Mufti uh, his name is Mufti Abdul Rahman uh, Mangera. So he is the teacher of uh, Imam Yama Niazi. And uh, he was previously in the States as an Imam, and currently he, he resides in, in the UK. And this book is actually a collection of um, of years of lectures and workshops that the Sheikh has done on the topic of marriage. And uh, there are a lot of very uh, practical uh, elements inside the book uh, that, he, that he speaks about. So if you've read uh, some of the chapters inside the book that, uh, that pertain to the topics that we're discussing today, uh, he mentions a lot of stories and a lot of things that, uh, that he encountered uh, throughout his years as an imam and as a counselor. So I would recommend that you get the book and that you, uh, that you read through it at least once, inshallah. So this should not be the only book on marriage that you ever read. But it is definitely a good start if you have never read uh, anyone before. So, the first topic that we'll be discussing today is the topic of finding the right person. Now, this is, uh, you know, the things that I'm going to mention over here are, you can think of them as a sort of guideline in terms of who you can think about as, as the right person. Um, when you are when you are in your search for a potential spouse, a potential partner for yourself, but this is not an exhaustive list, and neither can any list really be exhaustive. It's not really possible uh, to to sort of create a list of everything that uh, someone needs to have in order for you to marry them. Uh, it's probably not going to be the case that you're going to find somebody that ticks all of your boxes. So uh, the piece of advice that I can give is don't be overly picky in terms of the person that you, uh, that, that you are going uh, to marry. There was a, this is a true story, so I have my fair share of stories as well that I can tell you about people and uh, their quest to get married and uh, the, you know, the hurdles and the obstacles they encounter along the way. This is just from last week. Um, there, was, uh, there was a mother who was in my office, and her daughter is, uh, you know, she has, uh, she has this person in mind that she would like to marry, and he's a good Muslim, uh, a good Muslim young man, um, ticks all of the boxes that the family wants, uh, the thing that's holding up the marriage is, uh, is literally like a couple of inches. So this is, uh, you know, uh, they expect their, their son-in-law to be 5'8", and he is 5'7". 
So this is uh, this is holding up the marriage, and uh, this is uh, and uh, this is for some reason this is something that uh, that they the, the mother was very very insistent on. But no, uh, that you know my daughter is five seven, so he needs to be five eight. Um, so this is like non-negotiable for the mother. Uh, they did end up uh, acquiescing uh, after you know I made it apparent how silly such a demand was, and um, you know I, I jokingly told them that sister, uh, just make sure that for the rest of your life you never wear heels, and uh, you know you make sure you're always in dress shoes, and this will solve your one-inch problem over here, right? So this is. Uh, you know, it's it's sometimes silly. It's uh, uh, the, the things that people they they do, and the reasons they prevent young people from getting married. So don't be overly picky. Don't you know? It's not. Uh, um, First of all, that uh, this is uh, for for brothers. So many brothers, in their quest to get married, um, they go kind of like window shopping. So they will they will go and they will um, they will seek out and they will search as if they are like you know about to purchase in an item of merch uh, some sort of merchandise, and they will look at uh, you know young woman after young woman after young woman after young woman. And this is a sort of the, the the kind of swipe culture that we live in that you know. Uh, as if you are you are about to purchase uh, a new pair of shoes or something like this. Uh, so this is for the brothers. Don't do that. Uh, that you know, approach this with a level of maturity and seriousness. That you know, this is the person that you are going to spend the rest of your life with. You, you're not. You don't want to treat this as as if you are you are purchasing something. And on the other side, the sisters as well. Um, that uh, the number one advice that I would have for sisters who are seeking um, a husband, who are seeking a partner to spend the rest of their lives with, are keeping your expectations in check. So um, expectations in check means that oftentimes we have a problem uh, that we expect that immediately upon marriage your your husband will be able to provide you with with this uh, this very uh, lavish lifestyle that you have uh, dreamt up for yourself and uh, if there's uh, and most people if they are of a similar age to you uh, they will probably not have that uh, at least when initially in the years that uh, when you are getting married and uh, um, this this often prevents young women from getting married because they are not realizing the and sometimes it's not the young women themselves it's their families that they are not realizing the expectations that they have set for their husband or their husband to be are unreasonable so this is something to also keep in mind the first thing that we're going to do right now inshallah is we're going to uh, just briefly go over what the fuqaha they called kafa kafa means who are equals in terms of marriage. So this is something that is discussed in the books of fiqh, and although it is not as much of an issue nowadays as it once was in the past, it is, it is still an issue in many circles, many communities. It's a cultural issue for many people. So it is something that is important for us to discuss from the point of view of fiqh, and from the point of view of the Sharia, as to what is Islamic and what is simply cultural, and uh, what uh, what you must uh, um, what you must be mindful of, and what you can sort of uh, you know um, I wouldn't say ignore, but what to, what you can bend on. So, kafaa. So kafaa refers to in kafaa refers to two equals. So a kufu is someone who is in equal or um, in equal in terms of their societal or social standing of another. So this doesn't always refer to just the husband and wife dynamic, but this just refers to so most of us in terms of uh, uh, things like um, socio-economic status. We tend to be akfa, so we are we are of a similar class. Unless there's somebody sitting inside this room that is very 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 wealthy, most of us we we fall within the the sort of same uh, same range in terms of socio-economic uh, class. So you can think, uh, although this isn't uh, just in terms of uh, wealth, but this is this is one of the one of the metrics of kafa. 
So the fuqaha, they have various opinions with regards to, um, first of all, the first discussion that, uh, that is there is, is kafa'a even something that is worth considering when, uh, when you are approaching the topic of marriage? It means, is it necessary for you to be of an equal standing with your, uh, with your wife? So actually, the, uh, the entire discussion revolves around women and not men. So the discussion is, uh, in the books of fiqh, that a woman of a higher status, a woman of a higher a social status, a higher social class, is she permitted to marry a man of uh, a lower social class? It's, it's actually not discussed at all from the other, other point of view. So nobody disputes that it is permissible for a man of a higher social class to, uh, to marry a woman of a class beneath him. So this discussion is not even on the table. The entire discussion actually uh, is, is uh, from the point of view of women. So um, the first opinion in this regard is the opinion that uh, this actually doesn't even matter. This is not something that should be considered and uh, this is something that is un-Islamic and uh, uh, people like Hassan al-Basri, Imam al-Thawri, Imam al-Karhi, all of these, uh, these giants from amongst the, uh, the fuqaha, they all held the opinion that this is not something that the Sharia ah pays attention to in terms of uh, marriage. So it is permissible uh, for, for people to marry across the social spectrum and uh, uh, you know these things are un-Islamic, they are things that existed prior to Islam and we should pay no attention to them and uh, they present proofs in the, uh, to support their argument like the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam الناس سواسية كأسنان المشط لا فضل لعربي على عجمي ولا لعجمي على عربي إنما الفضل بالتقوى. That people are equals like uh, like the teeth on on a comb, and there is no preference given to an Arab to uh, over a non-Arab, and, and the, or a non-Arab over an Arab, and the only preference is given to people of taqwa. So this is, uh, in theory, this sounds great. However, this is the minority opinion. So this is not uh, the opinion of the majority of scholars. The majority of scholars, including scholars of all four madhahib, they are actually of the opinion that kafa'a is something that is given preference when it comes to um, when it comes to marriage, at least. So uh, they present in terms of their uh, their proofs. So there is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and what kafa'a means, and what uh, what are the um, the metrics of kafa'a, we will discuss in, in a moment. But uh, the, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Thalathum la tu'akhar," the three things when they approach, they are not to be delayed. As salatu ida atat, when the time of salah comes to perform the salah. Well, janaza to ida hadarat, that when the janaza, when the, when a person dies and the janaza is present, you should not unduly delay the janaza. And the final thing is, that the unmarried woman, when, um, when her equal is found, when her equal match is found. So the word kufa is actually used in the hadith, and this is narrated by Imam Timidi, rahimahullah. So this is proof number one. Um, the hadith of Jabir, radiallahu ta'ala, who la tunki from nisa illa al akfa that do not marry off your women except to those who are their equals. So this is again another hadith of the Prophet وسلم, narrated by uh, Dar Qutni among others. And the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha where she says وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَكْفَى and get married to your equals. And this is also, um, the, this is narrated by Imam Zaylai rahimahullah in, in Nasb al-Raya. And there are other hadith as well, so, but you get the picture. So according to the majority of scholars, kafa'a is something that we do pay attention to, at least in terms of marriage. Now, from a logical point of view, this makes sense, that in terms of uh, kafa'a in marriage. So if people, um, and in particular, again, this entire discussion revolves around women finding their equals from men. It, there is no discussion in, in terms of men, whether you marry uh, your equals, whether you marry uh, someone who is of a higher social standing than you, or whether you marry someone who is a lo of a lower social standing than you, that, that doesn't matter in terms of men, uh, because the responsibility, the responsibility of financial maintenance and the responsibility of heading your household lies with you. 
right, lies with, uh, with men. Um, the reason that this is paid attention to when it comes to women is because um, in terms of just from a logical point of view, if a woman is married to somebody who is of a lower social standing than her, so she comes from a household where she expects a certain lifestyle, for example. So let's say we are talking just uh, from the point of view of wealth. So she comes from a, a wealthy household. Uh, she is uh, accustomed to a certain lifestyle. And if she were to marry someone that is, that is of a lower social standing than her, then he will, by all the realistic means, he will not be able to provide her the kind of lifestyle that she is accustomed to and the kind of lifestyle that she deserves because this is, this is the, the, the kind of lifestyle that she, she grew up in. So this will, this will inevitably cause conflict in the marriage if, uh, if the husband is not able to meet her standards and her expectations. Uh, reason number two is because this is also a matter of, uh, of the honor of the families. So families will feel dishonored if a woman from uh, a respected family is... So like uh, in terms of uh, the books of fiqh, so they use... Uh, uh, um, they use words like Sharifa and Khasis. So this is, uh, uh, I'm not sure how exactly you would translate that in terms of uh, in the English language, but Sharifa means a woman of nobility, and Khasis means, um, you know, the guy who sticks around the street corners, right? So that's, that's what a Khasis is in terms of uh, just the, the Arabic language. But uh, uh, so he won't be able to provide that for her. He would also not be able to, uh, just socially, he would not know the etiquette of interacting with her family and with her extended family. So you don't just marry an individual. You marry into a, a, a social structure. You marry into a family. Then you would be expected to then um, interact with this family and the extended family. And uh, this, this would, again, create conflict in the marriage. Like, you know, if... Uh, um, if somebody were to, you know, uh, pick someone like me up and drop them off at a black tie dinner, I can probably have a conversation with people, but probably won't fit in very well over there, right? So it's, uh, it, you know, people have different expectations based on the, the circumstances and the context in which they grew up. So what is... Uh, so this we understand that from the ahadith and from just a purely logical point of view it makes sense that uh, a woman would want to marry someone who is her equal and not necessarily the other way around. So it is, uh, this discussion doesn't exist from the point of view of men. Now what does this, what is looked at in terms of the metrics of kafa'a? So this differs in terms of um, in terms of the, the, the different schools. So what is agreed upon is a few things. So number one is kafa'a in terms of her deen. So literally deen means that it is not permissible for a Muslim woman to marry somebody who is not Muslim, that, she, that he is not her equal. Anybody who is not Muslim is not her equal. So therefore she is not permitted to marry outside of her deen. And beyond this, even the scholars would pay attention to the level of practice. So a woman who is mutadayyan, a woman who is, who is someone who, who practices her faith, you know, she observes the hijab, she is somebody who prays, she is somebody who is particular about the practice of her deen, um, her parents rightfully would object to her, or her wali would rightfully object to her marrying somebody who is, you know, just uh, some, some thug. Right? So someone who doesn't practice the deen, somebody who doesn't pray, somebody who doesn't uh, live a religious lifestyle. So uh, obviously you know, any, any father would object to um, a daughter who is on the deen marrying somebody like this. And he has a right to object to this. That's his job. That's the job of the wali. The job of the wali is not just to you know, put on a, a three-piece suit and show up on the day of the nikah. The job of the wali is to look after the best interest of his daughter. This is, this is the job. So that means that he will scrutinize and he will vet the suitor before he gives his daughter's hand in marriage to him. This is his job. And this is why, um, so we don't give wilaya to a non-Muslim uh, over a Muslim woman. And this is in the case of a convert woman, her wali is, uh, is the imam. 
So is the imam means if she lives in a Muslim country, then the, the authority, the state would uh, would act as her wali. And in the in the case of uh, us here in the West, usually the imam would be like uh, a, a respected religious figure within the community is is who will act as her wali. And unfortunately, uh, not. Uh, the wali doesn't always, so in this case, in the case of a convert, um, sometimes it's more of a ceremonial role, to be honest, so uh, they don't exactly come and ask the sheikh, you know, should I marry this guy? And they kind of would show up on the day of the nikah, that I don't have a wali, so who is going to be my wali? So the imam would be the wali of, uh, of a woman who, uh, even if her father is present, but if he is non-Muslim, then he is not going to be her wali, because we don't give wilaya to kuffar over Muslim women. And this is the reason why, uh, uh, this is actually, uh, so we'll talk about this uh, in, uh, on Friday, inshallah, but this is actually the reason why a civil divorce is not sufficient in place of, uh, of, um, of an Islamic divorce always and automatically, because in the case of a civil divorce, the ruling judge is a non-Muslim, and we do not give wilaya to non-Muslims over the affairs of Muslims, and uh, including their family affairs. So there is an extra step that needs to be taken to dissolve this marriage Islamically, and it is not sufficient to simply obtain uh, a civil divorce in, in most circumstances. So what do we look at in terms of kata'a? Uh, number one, we look at um, the deen. Then the second thing that we look at is we look at uyub. So uyub means that uh, this is either, uyub means the things that um, things that are wrong with someone, basically. So, Uyub means that, uh, and, and, and not just things that are wrong with somebody, doesn't mean like, you know, that somebody's bald or something like that, right? But that's, uh, Uyub means things that are actually, are would render a nikah invalid, right? Or things that would be considered um, undesirable traits in a human being. So, if somebody, for example, hides, um, a disability of theirs, for example, right? So again, this is not a slight on somebody who suffers from a disability, but if um, for a Muslim woman, um, scholars would give weight to this, that you know, if someone, if her husband it has a disability, then she, and she is able-bodied, then he would not be considered a kufu for her. This doesn't mean that they can't get married. This just means that um, the, the wali has a right to object to this marriage. That, uh, so again, all of this, right? All of this doesn't mean that this marriage can absolutely not happen, and you can never get married to somebody who is of a of a lower social class than you. All this means is that your wali can object to this. That uh, this is this is a valid grounds for objection. And uh, so, an able-bodied woman uh, with uh, with a man who has a disability, um, somebody uh, we also give uh, weight over here to alhal, right? Alhal. Uh, this has the state of someone. So this, this means two things. One is their wealth. So if someone is, if there is a disparity in terms of um, their, their financial standing in society, if you, for lack of better words, that one comes from wealth and the other is, that doesn't come from wealth. So if there is a disparity in this, then this is also something that the wali has a right to object to this. So if the woman says that I want to marry so and so, and she is from a very wealthy family, and uh, her father has the right to object to this, because she, he is not her equal. Again, this, is, uh, um, this doesn't mean that he should object. I, none of these reasons means that he should always automatically object. We're just talking about the letter of the law, that he has a right to object. And the last thing over here is hasab. Right? Hasab means that uh, the lineage. So a person of, uh, of a noble lineage, a woman of a noble lineage, has the right to, uh, her wali has the right to object if she wishes to marry someone uh, whose lineage doesn't match hers. Now, what does this actually mean, right? So, okay, what does a noble lineage mean? So, a noble lineage means, so there are hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, al-Arabu kulluhum akfa, that Arabs are all, um, are all akfa, they are all equals for each other, right? 
So uh, in terms of lineage, we are not exactly talking about you know the nobility of your ancestors and you know so and so fought in World War One and you know so and so liberated Pakistan or you know whatever this is. That's, that's not what we're talking about in terms of uh, in terms of lineage. Um, scholars discuss things like if somebody uh, so if somebody was born outside of wedlock, right? So uh, technically. This is, although it's not that person's fault that they were born out of wedlock, but this person is termed walad zina in in the Sharia. That this is this child is a result of zina. This uh, this child was conceived and born out of wedlock. So this this child, uh, male or female, cannot be considered the equivalent for a person who was born out of a halal marriage. So. Um, for for a woman, her wali has the right to object if the man that she intends to marry is was born out of wedlock. Um, the scholars they also mention over here that if a woman, uh, sorry, if a man, right, if a man has non-Muslim parents, non-Muslim. So again, the entire discussion is one one dimensional here. So it's always from the point of view of the woman's family, not the point of view of the men's family. Because men tend to be independent in their social standing, and it's not exactly attached to uh, that of your father or that of the rest of your family. Whereas women, traditionally, their social standing is attached to that of their parents, that of their family, and the family that she marries into. The family that she marries into. So this is, you know, like it or not, this is undoubtedly the case. So therefore, it is always, again, I, this is probably like the fourth time I said this, it's always from the point of view of the women, not from the point of view of the men. So if a man has non-Muslim parents, then he is, although he is Muslim, then he is not considered an equal to a woman who has two Muslim parents. Okay, He, he would not be considered an equal for her. If a man has one Muslim parent, and a woman has two Muslim parents, then again he would still not be considered an equal for her. If a woman has one Muslim and one non-Muslim parent, and a man has one Muslim and one non-Muslim parent, then congratulations, you are considered equals. So this is just, uh, again, this may sound silly in our day and age, because we live in a, in a very uh, you know, individualistic Culture, so we tend to be individual in the term in the way that we see the world in the West over here. So uh, although, like most of us, we we probably still have ties to uh, to wherever it is that our parents came from. So we we have like a little bit of a blend of the individualistic and the collectivist cultures. So most Eastern cultures they tend to be very collectivist. So this is uh, something that you know um, what the extended family says. You know what the people in the village say and what the people on your street and your neighbors say and all of these things they matter in terms of, uh, of your life as a human being uh, in a particular society they still do matter in the west but they matter to a lesser degree you can get by reasonably well in in a western uh, individualistic society where you know you don't really have any extended family they don't or you probably do but they don't have as much of a say in your day-to-day -day life as they would in uh, in a country in the east for example so that's why uh, many of you may have a little bit of trouble understanding why these things are even discussed in the books of fiqh but you have to you have to take a step back and actually look at the society in which these things were being discussed, which we are still not totally immune from. So it's it's not that these things have disappeared. I can tell you plenty of stories of Muslims, uh, you know, young people growing up here in the West, whose parents may have immigrated here some of them years ago, and many of them are very well educated. They have uh, you know they have university degrees uh, here in the West. But in certain elements of culture, they are still very uh, culture bound. So um, I told you the story last week of uh, of the uh, the, uh, the the Sikh uh, woman who who converted to Islam, and uh, uh, she uh, uh, her, she wanted to marry a Pakistani boy, and the father uh, refuses this marriage, um, supposedly because she is not Muslim enough, but really because she is Sikh. 
or she came from a Sikh family. So this is these things they still do exist over here, and it's not that they have that they have totally disappeared. So this is just the actual uh, book um, of Kafa'a in terms of the books of fiqh. What I want to draw your attention to now is if you have the book with you, uh, then this is actually on page uh, seventy. So page 70 of uh, the, the Healthy Muslim Marriage Handbook. And if you don't, uh, uh, no problem, I will read it for you, inshallah. So this is actually uh, Mufti Abdul Rahman's uh, sort of step-by-step, uh, um, eight-step um, eight process for moving things forward from the point of when you find someone that you are potentially interested in, what needs to happen after that. Okay, so what needs to happen after this. So. We have talked about in the marriage seminar. Hands up if you were at the marriage seminar. Most of you were there, I'm assuming, right? Okay, so like a five-minute refresher of what uh, what you look for in a potential spouse. Uh, the primary consideration is given to one's deen and uh, the, the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that is important. It should be given the utmost importance. This doesn't mean that this is the only thing that you need to look for. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعٍ لِمَالِهَا وَلِحَسَبِهَا وَلِجَمَالِهَا وَلِدِينِهَا فَاضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاكِ So first thing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, uh, as it seems from the hadith, is addressing a group of men. So he is addressing the male companions in this hadith. Otherwise, the principles discussed in the hadith actually apply on both sides. So they apply uh, to men looking for a wife and they apply to women looking for a husband as well. So, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعِينَ A woman is married generally for one of four reasons. لِمَالِهَا for her wealth. لِحَسَبِهَا for her family. لِجَمَالِهَا for her beauty. وَلِدِينِهَا for her deen, for her piety. فَضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاكِ that you hasten in securing the piety of your spouse, make sure that you know you give preference to this. Talibat yadak is just an expression used in the Arabic language to to drive the point home and to put emphasis on something. Literally translated, it means may your hands be soiled. This is not like a dua against someone. This is just that you know you need to uh, you need to pay attention to the last thing that was just said right now. So from you know just a cursory look at this hadith. It may seem to someone that the Prophet ﷺ is telling you to discount the first three and only pay attention to the last one. So, you know, um, the person can look however they look, okay? The person can be, you know, uh, extremely poor and the person can be from a very bad family. But as long as they're pious and they pray five times a day, they're good. That's not what the hadith means. That's not what the hadith means. The Prophet ﷺ is telling you that these are the four valid reasons that someone seeks in a spouse. And this is actually, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ at least, that this is the order in which they were sought. So people in, in tribal pre-Islamic Arabia, they would give most preference to the wealth. So wealth was given most preference Second in line was was lineage, so this was also given a lot of uh, a lot of importance. Third in line was Jamal, was beauty, and the final thing that would be given preference was was piety in terms of however they defined piety prior to Islam. So the Prophet is simply telling you that you need to flip it around, and the most importance needs to be given to one's deen. That the, the piety that a person has, their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this needs to be given the most importance in terms of the person that you are going to spend the rest of your life with. But that's not the only thing that matters. This is something that, you know, all of us, we understand. Now, many, uh, you know, overzealous young people, right, they look at this hadith and they will see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that, you know, Piety is the only thing that you need to look for. Therefore, you know, I'm not even going to look at anything else. This would be a flawed and incorrect approach. So it is important that your, your spouse, the person that, uh, you know, your, your future husband or your future wife is somebody who you find attractive. 
This is, no, again, beauty is something that is subjective. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jabir radiallahu ta'ala, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said that I intend to get married. And he asked him, have you seen her? And he said, no. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? That go and see her. Go and see her. Go and look at her. فَإِنَّهُ أَحْرَىٰ أَنْ يُؤْدَمَ بَيْنَكُمَا That this is more likely to make sure that your union is a lasting one. So, and we talked about this in, in, in some detail last week as to what you can and cannot see. What you can and cannot see. And for those of you who forgot this or who couldn't remember, you can only see what is permissible for you to see means that, uh, you know, for... for uh, so technically speaking, uh, you know, for women, it's it's uh, you can see everything except the aura. So the aura for men is between the navel to the knee, and the aura for women is the entire body except the face, hands, and feet. Again, that doesn't mean that you know uh, that uh, that you should expose uh, you know your chest uh, in front of women, or that you know you should wear shorts, or you know you should uh, you know show up at your potential future in-laws' house in this manner. That's not what the, what that means. But this is just the, the legality of the ruling is that uh, this is what is permissible for you to look at and nothing else. So someone asked a question about people demanding to see, or not demanding, but asking to see hair uh, for women prior to marriage, it's, it, this is impermissible. It's impermissible to see this. Um, if you're really, really interested in how someone's hair looked, uh, then you know you can have uh, your mother or your sister or your aunt or somebody go and see this, but otherwise this is not something that is permissible for one to see. Uh, in fact, the Hanabila even say that it's not permissible to look at a woman's feet. You know, what are you going to do looking at her feet? Right? So, you know, you came to see her face, see her face, and khalas right? So that's it. <laughs> in the Hanbali school, they don't even consider it permissible to look at a woman's feet, just the face, right? Um, so this is, now beauty is also something that is important, right? So it is important, and again, in the overzealous nature of many young people, they don't give enough importance to this, right? Uh, they don't give enough importance to this. They don't, uh, even after marriage, uh, enough importance is not given to this um, on, on both sides, so from the sisters and from uh, the brothers. So, and I know this not because I've been to so many people's houses, but because I deal with conflict in marriage uh, on, on a daily basis. So one of the complaints that we often hear uh, in, in the beauty sector is that, you know, um, he has stopped making an effort after we got married. So, you know, before, you know, he used to smell good, he used to look good, he used to stay you know, well-groomed, and now, like, you know, he just comes home and wears a lungi and, you know, that's it, right? <laughs> that's, uh, and you know, the same thing on, uh, on the other side, right? So that, you know, whenever I come home, uh, prior to marriage, she would make an effort in the initial days of marriage, she would make an effort, uh, but, uh, you know, now uh, she would make an effort when she is going somewhere, but she doesn't make an effort for me. Right for for the husband. So this is this is a common source of conflict in many marriages. So you have to remember is that you know um, attraction, physical attraction. This is this is uh, this is something that is important uh, prior to marriage, and this is something that is important uh, even after marriage. Uh, lineage is also something that's important, and we talked a little bit about this. And despite how much uh, we believe that we you know we can, we decide the course of our own lives, and you know we don't really need to be worried about how such and such a person in my extended family views us, the reality of the matter is, is that you cannot live your life in a vacuum. So um, you will at some point interact with your extended family, her extended family, and in order to live you know, a sane, functioning life, this is encouraged, that you, know, you are encouraged to participate in, in societal activities, you are encouraged to participate in the affairs of your family and your extended family, and this is, you know, this, uh, the, and uh, believe me, that once you have children, right, once you have children, then uh, the more family you have to support you, the better. And you, you will, you will, you know, if you don't believe it now, you will thank me when you do, right? That the more family you have, the the better. The more uh, family, in, it takes. It's it's quite literally true that it takes a village to raise a child. So this village, you know, if you have your village, you don't want to cut yourself off from them. So that also means that you don't want to, even before you get married, you don't want to do something. You don't want to marry a person that your family is not going to accept. So if you know this, 
then I know at that time it's going to feel like this is the last person in the world that is going to come along and if you don't marry her or if you don't marry him, then you know, you're going to stay single until Yom al Qiyamah. but that's not going to happen, right? That's, uh, you know, realistically, this is not the, the last person in the world and if this doesn't work out, if you see uh, red flags in this, in this potential <coughs> scenario and your parents are not going to be happy and your family is not going to be happy and, you know, your life is going to be miserable and difficult, then this is something that you probably probably don't want to pursue. You probably don't want to pursue. It, it's going to be difficult at that time, uh, especially if you, you know, if you are, uh, uh, you know, if you are in love with this person, but you know, it's, it's it, as with anything, it's going to fade with time, and you have to be realistic about the way that you're going to spend the rest of your life. So lineage is also something that is important even in today's day and age, and you have to make sure. So it's not that it's, uh, you know, I advise against marrying outside of your culture. And, uh, you know, realistically, right, realistically, there is no ethnicity that we have enough of for them to sort of survive and thrive just by marrying within themselves here in the West. So uh, there are not enough of us. So you know there are not enough Pakistanis. There are not enough Arabs. There are not enough Indians. There are not and not enough Bengalis. There you know that that's just not going to happen. That uh, so there are going to be cross cultural marriages, and many families are okay with this. Many families they don't mind this. Some families they may mind this. Uh, you know. Uh, so you need to judge and you need to make mashwara with your elders, uh, with a trusted friend, uh, a local imam, someone who is familiar. Uh, with uh, you can lay your sort of uh, situation out in front of them and they will advise you whether for you in your current circumstance this is a good idea or this is not a good idea so it's not always a good idea and at the same time it's not always a bad idea okay um, so his sort of eight step process so now once you have sort of uh, found the person that, uh, that you intend to pursue marriage with. So the first thing is, before making, uh, number one, before making any contact, do some research if you can to find out about the person and their family. So you have identified a potential person for marriage. It is extremely, extremely important that you know, be like, you know, like, like somebody would uh, vet somebody who wants to work for the CIA, right? Vet this person like that. So you need to know about this person. This is especially in the you know in the kind of uh, society that we live in today. Uh, people have secrets, and secrets they they tear families apart. And I'm not talking about like you know somebody uh, I don't know uh, spray painted uh, the the school when they were in grade six or something like that. Not those kinds of secrets. But people have like terrible secrets that you know uh, that uh, that they keep from everyone. And uh, this is something that. They, uh, you know, this this could destroy families potentially. So, um, and sometimes, unfortunately, families actually assist in concealing these secrets. And this is not something that should be done. So, one is that if you had a problem in the past, or you committed some sin in the past, and it is in your past, you have moved beyond this, you have sought the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this, this is not a part of your life anymore, it's in the distant past, then fine. This is not something that you need to disclose to your future uh, husband or wife. Even after marriage, it's not a good idea to disclose this. Um, you know, uh, people have uh, again this this silly idea that uh, the, that after you get married, you need to like spill the beans on everything that you did before you got married, right? So, uh, like uh, every uh, you know every crush that you had in grade seven, and you know every the, every crazy thing that you did in you know when you were sixteen years old, and all of these things that you know you need to disclose to your husband in the name of transparency, or to your wife in the name of transparency. Um, but it, that's that's not the case. So you don't disclose sins. Disclosing sins is in itself it's a major sin. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, is narrated to have said, "Kullu ummati mu'afan illa mujahideen." That the entirety of my ummah will be forgiven except the mujahideen. And who are the mujahideen? The uh, wa'inna min al-mujahara an yamal an yamal al-rajul bil-layli amalan fa wa yusbihu yukshifu sitra Allahi anhu. 
that uh, the person he commits a sin at night and in the morning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed this person's sin for him and this person goes and removes the curtain from his sin. So Allah has concealed the sin and this person intentionally goes and advertises the sin that this person has committed and this person will not be forgiven. This is arrogance in the face of, uh, of sin, that you are committing sin and then you are being arrogant about this, right? And uh, so um, this is something that should not be done. And this is something that we should be, uh, there, is, there is hope for all sinners, except the ones who are arrogant and proud regarding their sins. So this is something, this is actually the definition of fisk. So it is makroor, tahrib, extremely undesirable, close to haram, to perform salah behind a fasiq. And what is the definition of a fasiq? A fasiq is somebody who openly sins. Everybody sins, but this is a person who openly sins, who openly disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And such an individual does not deserve to uh, to lead the salah and does not deserve to uh, people to, to stand behind him in salah. And in terms of salah, right, we are we are told that uh, you know Sallu Khalfa Kullu Barrin wa Fajir that you know as long as he is the Imam, you perform salah with him regardless of whatever he does in his personal life, that's none of your business. You perform salah behind this person, except the fasid. The fasid is the open sinner, the proud, arrogant sinner. It is makru, it is disliked to perform salah behind this person. So, before before pursuing this any further, you need to do some research. Now, how are you going to do research? Right? Are you going to like Instagram stalk them? How are you going to do your research? You're going to do your research by the way that it has been done for hundreds and thousands of years. You're going to get your family involved. If you have family, you're going to get them involved, and you're going to have you know people ask about them. That nobody can live under a rock, right? So there's going to be somebody who, who knows this person, who knows that family, what they are like, which masjid they go to. If they don't go to any masjid at all, that's a red flag. That you know how can how can the, the entire family not be associated with with any masjid or the Muslim community? So um, this is this is the type of homework that you need to do. Number two. Exchange basic details through a third party. For instance, uh, you know the sheikh says a CV. So you know this is actually something that <laughs> that people do. Uh, that uh, they would uh, they would come to uh, uh, they would come to the masjid and they would uh, they would say that you know sheikh I'm looking for um, for for a girl for for my son. He's you know uh, 26 years old and he's he's an engineer and, and here's his CV. Right? Are, you, are, are you looking for a job for him or are you looking for a wife for him? Right? <laughs> But this is, uh, this is uh, you know, so I think what the sheikh means by a CV is just general details regarding someone that who they are, how many sisters they have, how many brothers they have, uh, where they were born, how old they are. Uh, th these types of details uh, should be exchanged with this person through a third party. So again, you know, like if you recall Imam Yama's example of, you know, receiving a letter in third grade, don't do that, right? So don't pass details uh, like this, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is bad etiquette to do this. Um, so you need to do this through a trusted third party. So preferably a family member in the absence of a family member. I understand that many of you, uh, you may be studying here, you may not have family over here. Um, so you can do this through some other trusted third party. So brothers do this with brothers and sisters do this with sisters. It's not that, you know, so, you know, if uh, um, usually married couples, this works best with. So if someone intend if someone is intending to get married, um, the, uh, uh, the brother is interested in in uh, a sister, then they would simply give the, you know pass on this information to a brother who is married, and that brother's wife can then initiate contact. So there is an etiquette and way of doing these things. Number three is seek advice and counsel mashallah, with your family and perhaps teachers and trusted friends. That is this even a good idea? Sometimes, like right off the bat, people will say this is an absolutely terrible idea for you to uh, get married to such a person and you should not pursue this any further. And be open-minded in listening to this advice. So the entire purpose of seeking advice from someone is that you're going to act on that advice. If you're going to go and seek advice from you know every sheikh in the province, but then at the end of the day, you're just going to do whatever you want. Then why why did you go and waste your time and all of their time? So uh, if you you know the, the the etiquette of seeking mashwara is that you are doing this sincerely. You sincerely go and seek counsel, and then you act on that counsel. Okay. And number four, ask Allah through the istikhara prayer. 
So this is important. That even before, so a lot of people, when do they perform istiqa? Okay. So they have already introduced themselves to the family. They have already, you know, they have all but like set a date for the wedding, and then they decide, oh yeah, you know, I should maybe perform istiqa as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, no. That istikhara is seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you become emotionally invested in something. So you're not going to see clearly once you become emotionally invested in something. That if you if you have found that, you know, this is the person that I'm going to marry and inshallah, you know, my life is going to look like, you know, um, a fairy tale and this is uh, this is where I'm going to live and this is how many kids I'm going to have and this is, you know, the, this is the kind of house that I'm going to live in and the, this, this, that and the other thing. And now, you know, let's perform istikhara. So you have, you have already... Uh, you know, istikhara is seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you need to do this at the initial stage, the initial stage, prior to things getting serious. And uh, Shaykh mentions elsewhere in his book that until your actual nikah is done, that you are rationally invested but you are not emotionally invested. Okay? This is, this is actually very, uh, you know, uh, I read this sentence many times and it's, it's actually something that's, that's a very beautiful piece of advice. That until you are actually married, your nikah is actually done. That you know you are you know you are in the in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you are husband and wife. You remain rationally invested in the process. Obviously, if you're not invested in the process, then it's not going to work. But you remain emotionally aloof. So again, two things: rationally invested, emotionally aloof. You do not become emotionally entangled with someone. It's haram. You can't do this until you are actually married to that person. So this is something that's important. So perform the istikhara. How do you perform istikhara? Istikhara is very simple. People make it very, very difficult. Uh, first of all, you should be performing your own istikhara. Um, that it's, uh, I know in some cultures, it's, uh, it's uh, a custom to sort of go to the sheikh or the imam of the masjid and uh, you know, um, give them some nitai and ask them to perform istikhara. You don't do that, you perform your own istikhara. Istikhara is you seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We always appreciate the nitai, but we're not going to do istikhara for you, inshallah. So this is, uh, uh, it's, uh, you just perform two rakah salah. Uh, at, preferably at night, and the, you can really do it at any time. But the reason we we suggest performing it at night is because you tend to have a clearer mind at night, and uh, then you know you you are you are settling down for the day, and you per, you just make wudu, perform salat al isha, perform two rakat salat al istikhara, and then make the dua. And uh, it is preferable that you use the dua that's mentioned in the sunnah. اللهم إني أستغيرك بعلمك وأستقدرك بقدرتك وأسألك من فضلك العظيم فإنك تقدر ولا أقدر وتعلم ولا أعلم وأنت علام الغيوب اللهم إن كنت تعلم أن هذا الأمر خير لي في ديني ومعاشي وعاقبة أمري فاقدره لي ويسره لي ثم بارك لي فيه وإن كنت تعلم أن هذا الأمر شر لي في ديني ومعاشي وعاقبة أمري فاصرفه عني واصرفني عنه واقدر لي الخير حيث كنت وارضني به so this is the, the masnoon dua for istikhara. So you should make it, uh, you know, first of all, like um, a lot of people, this is like the one and only time they perform istikhara in their entire life is when they want to get married. Okay? So istikhara is not something that is a once in a lifetime thing. Istikhara should come before any major decision that you make in your life. So, you know, which school you're going to go to, perform istikhara, if you have uh, more than one option. Which job you're going to take, perform istikhara. Uh, you know, which city you're going to move to, perform istikhara. Who you're going to get married to, perform istikhara. Which, uh, which school you want your children to attend, perform istikhara. All of these things, you know, the, uh, wherever you have options, you seek the guidance uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there will be so much khair and barakah in your life. This is a guarantee that if you if you follow guidance that is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there's, you know, it's not that your life is guaranteed to be easy. Nobody's life is easy. Everybody has challenges that they have in their life. But you will have, uh, uh, you will have a sense of contentment that, okay, you know, this, what I am doing here, this was the result of my istikhara. Okay? So you perform istikhara, istikhara is performed like this. Um, you should uh, try and memorize this dua because you're going to use it many, many times over the course of your life. Um, and uh, even if you don't memorize the dua, then just making the dua that, oh Allah, I'm seeking your guidance in this matter. I have these options in front of me. Uh, allow me to choose in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
the option that is most beneficial for, so this is the gist of the istikhara dua that I'm translating for you allow me to choose the option that is most beneficial for me in this world and in terms of my akhirah and whatever that is make it easy for me and facilitate that for me and uh, if this, what I'm considering, is, is what is good for me, then allow me to continue in this path and make it easy for me and remove the obstacles. And if this is bad for me in terms of my, in my life in this world and uh, my life in the Akhirah, then make it go away from me and may it turn me away from it and allow me to remain upon the good uh, for as long as I live and allow me to remain content with this. So, you know, what a powerful dua. What a powerful dua. That you are first asking for guidance and in the same du'a, you are asking that if this is if this is what is good for you, then this is this is the path that you remain on. And if this is what is bad for you, then the, the path closes, and you are happy with this path, either opening or closing. So whatever the case is, and this is uh, you know this this is something that um, I can tell you from personal experience, time and again in my life, that it's not always that the result of the istikhara is going to be the easy route, but it's going to be the right one. It's going to be the right one. So it's, there, there's no guarantee, it's not written anywhere in the hadith that you know, whatever uh, the result of the istikhara is, this is going to be the easiest thing that you ever do in your life. But it's going to be the right thing for you. And the right thing for you uh, might not be the right thing for someone else. Like for example, like you know, uh, two guys, uh, so uh, you, know, you perform istikhara uh, regarding uh, a certain young woman and uh, it uh, comes a no for you, and then your friend performs it, and it comes a yes for him. So that's great, right? That that doesn't mean like you know there's there's uh, that, because it's not that there's something wrong with her. It's just that your situation will not work out, right? So this is this is also something that uh, the, because the people do this sometimes, like oh you, you want to get married to her or you want to get married to her, don't do that. I did this to Hala, and it was bad. It was bad for you. <laughs> It was, it was not the right decision for you. It's not that you know, she's a bad person or he is a bad person. That's not what the result of the istikhara was. So you do this for one night, and the scholars, they mentioned that you can do this even up to seven nights. And what you are looking for is you are looking for an inclination in your heart, that you are, stronger, you are, you are more stronger inclined towards a yes, I should proceed, or a no, I will not proceed. This could come in the form of a dream, but it's not necessary that it's always a dream, okay? And after this, um, that you arrange a meeting, uh, for, uh, so if they uh, are assuming it's a positive, then you arrange a meeting with this family. You arrange a meeting with this family, and again, this is the correct etiquette of doing things, that you should introduce the family, you should have them involved in this. Yeah, again, uh, that family compatibility is also a huge issue. That uh, you know you are you are not just marrying an individual. You are marrying into an entire family. They are also your your potential wife or your potential husband is also marrying into an entire family. Uh, this becomes even more complex if you come from different cultures. So it's important for the families to meet one another at the early stages of this. And um, from here, uh, again, if. Uh, it, you don't have to do this like you know it's not uh, upon the completion of one step you you must do the next step you can continue performing the istikhara even uh, along the way so it's uh, you can start the istikhara meet the family and continue the istikhara it's not uh, a hard and fast and uh, then finally you make a decision right so the, the eighth and final step is you make a decision and uh, whether or not this is uh, this is the right uh, um, the right person for you, whether you want to pursue this marriage or you don't want to pursue this marriage, and uh, then um, you can talk about the, the particulars about you know when you're going to get married, when you're not going to get married. Um, now after this, so after what, so this is what we would call what we talked about last week, the khitbah. So this is like um, there's no such thing as like an engagement uh, Islamically, but this is uh, the Islamic equivalent of an engagement is the khitbah. This is the proposal or the offer of marriage that is being made is. Uh, this is what's happening over here. Now, even after this, it's important for, because there is no such thing as an Islamic, uh, the Islamic dating, but it is important for this, uh, this young man and this young woman to have some sort of understanding uh, with each other about who they are and what kind of person uh, this is, especially in today's day and age. You, you know, if you were, um, you know, if you were living, uh, 
in the time of your parents and uh, you know you were living in the, in the same uh, uh, village or town in in Lebanon and uh, you know everybody had like uh, the same culture same cultural values uh, ate the same food generally had the same uh, world view then many things are already automatically assumed about someone you cannot assume this in today's day and age so there are so many students right here, Muslim students, I'm, I'm not going to say inside this room, hopefully not inside this room, but on this campus, right, on this campus, who may subscribe to, uh, to uh, you know, ideologies that are not compatible with Islam. So they may have, uh, you know, they may not have a worldview that is centered on the Sharia. Their worldview may be centered on, on uh, some, um, you know, Marxist or neo-Marxist uh, ideological framework. Or uh, they may be like on the extreme end of, uh, the, you know, the, of, uh, of the right wing, for lack of better terms. Um, or they may, uh, uh, they may have a problem in their aqidah such problems do exist, right? So uh, th this is a true story again, that, uh, you know, there, is, uh, there was an ongoing discussion between, um, between uh, uh, two individuals, and, uh, you know, it came to the point where they are about to get engaged, and uh, this, uh, at the house where they, where they, are, uh, they are having this discussion, the, the proposal is about to be made, um, just uh, in, a comment is made, um, by by the the father of uh, of the the groom um, or the groom to be they, they didn't get married thankfully that uh, that reference Rashad Khalifa so anybody know who Rashad Khalifa is Rashad Khalifa is uh, is uh, is a dubious figure uh, um, that that started a movement that's based on numerology and uh, uh, they would pass themselves off as Muslim, but uh, you know their their aqidah is corrupt in this regard. So uh, you know this is by all other metrics this is a good family. But uh, you know had they married their daughter into this family, uh, this uh, you know I'm not sure what kind of religious upbringing these children would have. So these are even these things are things that are important to consider in today's day and age. That not everybody that's, that looks Muslim and that has a Muslim name may subscribe to the same same belief uh, frame, uh, same beliefs as you, right? Um, quite often people come to the masjid and they they ask to have nikahs performed with Ismailis. And so the Ismailis, um, in in our older books of Aqidah, they are referred to as the Baltiniya. So these are people who are uh, who subscribe who who uh, in the, so these are the guys that follow the Aga Khan, right? Um, so they uh, we don't consider them to be Muslim, right? So the, the fact is that we don't consider them to be Muslim. We consider them to be outside of the fold of Islam, and for the simple reason is that they um, they believe in, in in an esoteric version of uh, of Islam that gives uh, more weight to you know being a good person and you know being a good person inside and jannah and jahannam are not actually things uh, they are just you know a state of mind and a state of being and uh, the Allah khan has the ultimate right to tashriya so he can change the laws of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which he has done so they you know if you know anything about them they don't pray five times a day they only pray twice a day uh, there is uh, there is a gap is not 2.5 percent it's 10 percent um, for them, interest is permissible, um, uh, khamr is permissible, alcohol. So, the, the, and this is because the Al Khan said so. So, obviously, you cannot, uh, anybody who believes this is not considered a Muslim. Um, in Pakistan, uh, the, there is, uh, there is uh, an ongoing issue. Um, so, Pakistan is the one country in the world where Qadianis are, are by, by law, they are not considered Muslim and they cannot call themselves that. So, that much we have going for, uh, for Pakistan. Right? But uh, but apart from that, they do they do try to pass themselves on, um, uh, you know. And uh, you know, I, I love uh, my Pakistani brothers and sisters. I'm not Pakistani, though, right? So uh, this uh, uh, um, in the Western world, they do try to pass themselves off as Muslim, right? They they would try to pass themselves off as Muslim, but they are not. Anybody who believes in a Nabi after the Prophet sallallahu cannot by any means be called Muslim. Yet, you know, they are they are here, they are in the community, they would try and inf infiltrate our masajid every now and then. And, uh, you know, at the Burnaby Masjid, for example, in the summer, 
uh, there is you know, uh, less foot traffic during the day and they would try and leave their literature. And I, I don't know how, uh, you know what they think they would really achieve. Like the average, regular, everyday masjid-going uncle who doesn't have um, you know, any, any real intense education about the deen, he, he would uh, just see the book and he would come and he would say, you know, this is a, 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 the Qadianis left this book, right? So you know, we have a very solid foundation in terms of our aqidah and our belief that it doesn't you know, require a, a, a university level education to understand these things, what is corrupt is corrupt. So these are also things that you need to be wary of uh, in, in, this, in the kind of society that we live in. So the way that you will get to know this person beyond just you know, how they look is through uh, supervised interactions with this person. This person is not your, your husband, this person is not your wife. The laws of, uh, of gender interactions still apply to you. Any unnecessary texting uh, uh, you know, in the middle of the night or even in the middle of the day is not permissible for you. But it is permissible to get to know this person in a supervised environment where uh, none of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are being broken. And this is something that I would encourage for you. Right? So once upon a time, that it was okay that you know uh, that uh, you, you see the person you like the person um, and uh, you know you set a date for the marriage and you get married and you can get to know them after uh, the 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 nikah, right so there was uh, um, there was a, a brother last week on my way out uh, he asked me an interesting question he said sheikh uh, first question was sheikh are you married yes i am married alhamdulillah how did you get married i said that's a long story and he said maybe you should tell the story right so maybe I will tell the story one day, right? But not today, not right now. <laughs> so um, this, uh, these are generally the steps that need to be followed uh, in terms of seeking a spouse and then furthering this. I mentioned this last week, and I will mention it again right now. Does anybody have the time? Uh, okay, so it's um, So. Prolonging the engagement period unnecessarily, so having a very, very, so again, the engagement, like relatively, like after the khitbah until the actual nikah is conducted, prolonging this period unnecessarily is something that I don't advise for a number of reasons. Number one, that uh, you are young, so. Um, you know, it's it's very it's it's very hard to control yourself when like the finish line is is within sight, right? So you know, you you have you have maintained uh, uh, you you have been a good person. Uh, you have uh, you know maintained following the rules all throughout high school, all throughout your university education. But now you're engaged, right? So now like you know you're going to get married to this person. So you know shaitan gets the better of you. You begin the texting inappropriate things to one another um, text is notorious for like you know um, for not being a very uh, comprehensive means of communication like some people the way they text you can't really like interpret what what's going on in this person's mind right like you know some people the standard response to any text that you send them is okay right like you know that you know there's there's there's, there's a fire in the SFU okay Right? So there's like there's a lot that that can be misinterpreted in, in a text, right? So uh, then this leads to misunderstandings between people. This leads to you know this leads to all sorts of crazy problems. So don't prolong this unnecessarily. Uh, you don't have to immediately like move in and start a family right after your nikah. So if for some reason this this period needs to be prolonged, then at least have a nikah. At least have a nikah, have the nikah, not like a secret basement nikah, but like a real nikah, right? Like, you know, that's, you know, a'linu nikah, that you make a'lan of the nikah, there are witnesses, people in the community know, so that, you know, if once in a while you, you want to go somewhere with this person, you want to have dinner with this person without a chaperone, um, you know, you want to, to communicate with this person, then this is okay, this is permissible, because you are now married to this person, uh, you don't have to, like, uh, move in together, different communities, different uh, cultures have different uh, words that uh, that are that are for um, uh, the, the like official starting of someone's life together after the nikah, like you know officially moving in together and uh, officially starting your life. So uh, like uh, um, whatever you call it in your particular culture, that doesn't need to happen immediately. 
you can still have a nikah if this period needs to be prolonged. Ideally, you just you know you, you're engaged um, within a matter of a couple of months. You should have uh, the nikah and you should start the rest of your life. There's no there's no reason to prolong this unnecessarily. But if there is a reason, then this is the way that it should be done, inshallah. And uh, you can convince your parents this. A lot of parents they have these uh, these expectations in terms of you know what the nikah will look like, what the marriage will look like, and they are coordinating you know. 600 different people's schedules from you know five different continents and they're waiting for all of them to arrive in in our beautiful province before the nikah can go ahead um, so that you know unless they're able to do that within a couple of months uh, at least the nikah should be done so that uh, you know this this becomes a permissible um, interaction between these two individuals so this is just the part about um, finding somebody of course we're also meant to talk about maintaining a marriage so in terms of maintaining a marriage what do you think that the main obstacle um, to to uh, to a per why do marriages fall apart let's let's ask it that way so i see a lot of you are getting tired so i'm going to ask you this question why do marriages fall apart any ideas Lack of communication, okay. Rights are not fulfilled. Rights are not fulfilled, okay. Yes. Some issues or misunderstandings between different countries. Misunderstandings, okay. Anything else? Yes. Promises aren't kept. Promises aren't kept, okay. Yes. Lack of adventure. <laughs> okay. So, in my experience, the number one reason marriages fail is actually because of a lack of effective communication. So, if you think that you're going to get married and you're never going to, to fight, right? So, like, you're in for a very, very rude surprise once you get married. So, every marriage has conflict. It is impossible that somebody is married and they do, they, they've never had a fight, or they've never had a conflict, and voices have never been raised, and they've never had a disagreement with theirs. Anybody who's been married for like five minutes knows that you know, you're, you're going to not always agree with your spouse. Right? So this is, the issue comes when this disagreement or this conflict is not managed correctly. Okay? And all of the things that you just mentioned to me right now, all of them can be fixed if the communication is done effectively. So what our problem is, right, what our problem is, is that we actually don't know how to communicate effectively. And there's also a gender gap here that the way women communicate is not the way men communicate, and the way men communicate is not the way women communicate. So it is also important for the husband to understand from the point of view of a woman how she communicates and it's also important for uh, a woman to understand from the point of view of a wife how a man communicates. So it's not that you will communicate in the other way but it's just that you, for the sake of understanding, you, you understand how the other gender communicates because they are very different. They, they are very, very different in terms of the way that one communicates. So, and again, this is like, you know, uh, oftentimes people will say that, oh, you know, but I don't do that, right? Okay, so this is like a general rule, right? So a general thing that um, obviously some men are more expressive uh, than, than others and some women are, are more assertive than others. But generally speaking, generally speaking, men, they tend to be problem avoiders. So, you know, they would rather just not talk about something then, then have to deal with it at all, right? So this is generally speaking, right? So they would rather, you know, the, so like uh, they would rather uh, not, not, you know, it, they, it's not that they don't understand that there is an issue here, right? There is something that needs to be talked about. It's just that they would rather not talk about it, generally speaking. And women, on the other hand, 
generally speaking, they are more expressive. They, they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them in this manner. They tend to be more in tune with their emotions than men. And this is a necessary part of the way Allah created a woman because she is a mother as well. So imagine, uh, like, you know, if, if mothers had the same, like, uh, emotional regulation as, uh, as most men. That, that would be a disaster. How would, she, how would she even know, you know, what uh, a child who doesn't speak and who, who is not capable of expressing what, uh, what he, he or she needs uh, in, in, in words. And, you know, like, so anybody who has children, so most of you don't have children, but you know, like, uh, I can give you, uh, like, an example uh, that I have, alhamdulillah, two children. So, they can be crying in front of me, and I would have absolutely no idea what it is that they need. So, you know, I can try to give them some food, I can try to give them this, I can try to give them that, but in reality, and my wife can walk in the room, and in 30 seconds, uh, the child is, is like one, doesn't speak yet, right? But she knows what, what this child needs. So, emotional regulation, not emotional regulation, but being in tune with one's emotions is, is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, has created uh, in, in women, and men generally they lack this. Again, this is not like you know uh, just a black and white thing. Some men are better at it than others. So, in terms of how you communicate, so the the, the medium of communication for most sane adults is what? How are you supposed to communicate? You're supposed to talk about things, right? So now, how are you going to talk about something? How are you going to talk about something? So, I am a mediator. Okay, so. What we do when two parties come into the room, and this is something that you can use even outside of marriage, this is something that you can use uh, in your day-to-day -day life, in any interaction, but especially when it comes to husband and wife, this is something that you can use. So um, there are two things. That One is what we would call the issue. And this usually comes in the form of like a statement. Okay, This is, this is the issue. So the issue, for for example, that you know, um, the issue is that you don't come home on time. Okay, this is the complaint that the wife is making regarding her husband, and his issue is that you know, um, you don't cook for me. Okay, so again, both of these are statements. So this is this is his issue. Now it's impossible to resolve someone's issue. So, yes, you can say that, okay, you know what, from tomorrow you come home at 9 o'clock and from tomorrow you start cooking, right? Congratulations, we've solved the problem, right? Wrong. That problem has not been solved. So, usually people, they are, and this, this is across the spectrum, both men and women, they are very bad. So, what they are expressing in terms of their issue, there is actually something what we would call the interest that underlies that issue. Okay? So you can think of this as like an iceberg. So the majority of that iceberg is actually underwater, and those are the interests that underlie the issues. So why does so a woman who says to her husband that you don't come home on time? Okay. So this is this is her issue. So the solution to this issue would be that you just come home on time. But that's not automatically going to fix what she wants. So what do you think her underlying interest is? In his, in his not in this statement of hers. So this is something that this is a this is a, and again there's no right or wrong answer to this. This is an exercise and usually and I'll tell you how you uncover this. But they're right here. So uh, let's ask the sisters on this side that uh, when when someone says that you know you don't come home on time, what is her underlying uh, the, her interest in this? Yes, at the back. Interest. So the underlying would be the interest. The yeah. issue is that oh, he doesn't sorry, come the home issue, on time. Like the issue is that there is not enough quality time. It's not about him coming home on time. It's about spending more quality time with the okay. person. Okay. Yes. Or, or could you mean that I miss you? Okay. I miss you. Yes. Not giving help. Not giving help. Okay. So yeah, I wanted to 
uh, a lot of these things are also issues. So interests are usually framed in terms of needs. So uh, most of you have probably heard of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So those are like the very bare bones essential things that people need in terms of uh, fulfillment in their life. But there are, there are obviously other things. So you can think of uh, interests as unmet needs. So when the husband doesn't come home on time, what is the unmet need from the wife that she is voicing in, in, this, this, in the form of this issue or this statement that you know you don't come home on time? So th that, that may help you. Yes? If you're not informing when you're going to be home. Okay, so w in, in one word, what would, the, what would the interest be there? Why does she want to be informed? So security is, is an interest of, uh, of someone, that a sense of security, um, a sense of being valued, appreciated, all of these things are things that are lacking um, when someone voices this, this issue. So it's not that she expects him always right, the, uh, to come home at, uh, at 9 o'clock. She's missing something else, and this is being voiced in, in, this, in this manner, that you, know, you don't come home on time. Now again, that uh, the brothers, right? So when someone says, uh, you know, in the, in the course of conflict that you don't cook for me, right? Or you, so what is the the underlying interest? What is the need that is not being met here? Yes, at the back. You don't love me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, what else? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Lack of reassurance. Lack of reassurance. Okay. Yes. Walking in kitchen. Okay. Yes. Doesn't care about me. Okay. Okay. So, so you're just hungry. <laughs> so there, there are other ways that that need can be fulfilled. So, but why this, right? Yes. I was going to say, um, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't here for the question, but based on the topic, I was going to say sometimes people tend to sleep a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to pretend I didn't. <laughs> so usually for men, it's actually fairly simple, right? Fairly simple. That, um, so. In general, men tend to be a lot more black and white than, than women. So there's not like uh, a whole lot of uh, emotions that, uh, it's not that they're not there, but they tend to, uh, they tend to be very easily categorized into like, you know, he's either hungry, thirsty, angry, mad, or happy, right? That's, so, uh, but generally speaking, the underlying interest for most men in whatever complaint they are making the overwhelming majority of the time is that he feels that he doesn't get the respect that he ex he was expecting. Okay, so it's not that he expects you to cook every day necessarily, unless he does, but it's that he feels disrespected, and that is coming out in this uh, in this he's voicing it this way that you don't cook for me, and he probably has uh, a list of other things that you don't do and. He's not concentrating at that time, uh, although it's not that he doesn't understand, he doesn't acknowledge the things that you do do, but his, his unmet need here, most of the time, for most men, the chief need in a marriage for most men is what? Is respect. And the chief need, this is not the only need, the chief need for a woman in marriage is what? The chief need for a woman in marriage is what? I'm not going to say it because <laughs> security is the chief need for a woman in marriage. Because this is someone who is leaving their entire household, where they grew up, their parents, their siblings, and they are moving into an entirely different household. The chief need of women in marriage is security. And the second is what? Affection. And love. 
and this is a need on both both sides. So respect comes first for men, security usually comes first for women, and second on both of their radars is love. Now, the way that one expresses love is also, uh, the, or doesn't express love, is also a source of conflict in many people's marriage. So many, uh, many brothers, uh, you know, when, when their wives would complain of lack of affection, they would bring out a list of things that they, had, they have done in the recent past that in their minds shows that they, they love their wife and they, they wish to so, show affection to her. And when uh, brothers, when husbands bring about uh, this, uh, this, this in the course of mediation, um, then the wife would uh, then uh, you know, say a whole bunch of things that she believes that in her view is the way that she has expressed in the recent past her love for her husband. There's a problem here. Does anybody know the problem? Yes. There are five love languages, so the way you Perfect. give love is not the way that you might want to. So it. today, I took the burden of carrying a whole bunch of books here uh, <laughs> for for you to see and for you to eventually read, hopefully, inshallah. So these are all books that I would recommend that all young people read, and this some of them are about marriage. Most of them are about communication, okay? So I actually carry these in my bag, so hopefully you read them, right? Because I usually don't carry around like seven books in my bag. So uh, the first book that uh, is, uh, there was a sister last week who asked uh, a question about what are some of the questions that you should ask a potential spouse. So um, in this book, in the book that you guys have, the, the Healthy Marriage Handbook, there are a list of about 30 or so questions that are mentioned in here as well. There is a more comprehensive uh, set of questions in this book um, that I will also, it's also available as, uh, as a PDF that I will share with uh, the MSA uh, that you can have a look at. But uh, uh, this book was written by a sister who is, who is a marital counselor, as well as uh, uh, the previous imam of the Adam Center in the US. So this is a very good book. It's called uh, Before You Tie the Knot, very comprehensive, uh, very practical. Um, the, what the sister was just referencing is actually this book. So this is a book called The Five Love Languages. I know, I know, brother, it's a very cheesy book. But it is actually very helpful, right? So very helpful book. Um, it's written by uh, a person who does have a faith background, uh, Gary Chapman. Um, so he's not Muslim, obviously, but uh, he's, uh, he does come from a background of faith, so you can appreciate um, the way that uh, he comes from a conservative background, basically. Uh, the same author, different book. Uh, things that I wish I'd known before we got married. <laughs> so this is hopefully before you get married, you can read the book. And the other books actually have nothing to do with marriage per se. So one is called Negotiating the Impossible. The second is Getting to Yes. And the third is Difficult Conversations. So these three books can help you in your professional life, but they can equally also help you in your married life. So effective communication. So all problems can potentially be solved as long as they are, they are spoken of effectively and the communication is, is constructive. So fighting is not bad, conflict is not bad, but conflict must be constructive. So there should be something that you gain from conflict and you're not just tearing each other down each time you fight. So um, in terms of maintaining marriage, maintaining open lines of communication, and communicating effectively with your partner. And this takes time, it takes practice, it takes getting to know somebody. Um, so not all people are the same, not everyone's temperament is the same. Uh, some people, um, they, uh, they are people who, who deal very well with, uh, with criticism, right? So some people are very terrible at dealing with criticism. So, uh, you know, sugar coating, has its benefits sometimes, right? So some people, uh, they, they need to receive criticism with a whole lot of praise mixed in with it in order for it to be effective. Other people would rather that you just cut to the chase. 
and you know if there's something that you see that you don't like and that you would like to criticize I want to actually hear it come out of your mouth so you need to get to know the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with who is this person how do they communicate um, and uh, what methods are effective with this person what is not effective with this person there is um, you know there is there is a category of people uh, that uh, um, uh, that we call high conflict individuals. So these are people who who are who are prone to conflict. These are people who don't do conflict very well. These are people who uh, you know, and and they're usually very like. So it's not just in marriage that they would have conflict. So these are people who would have a conflict in, in pretty much every area of their life. So they don't get along with their siblings, they don't get along with their parents, they, they, they've probably been disciplined at work or at school. Um, so these are people who are prone to conflict, these are people who, uh, who conflict is not something that they do very well. There is an entirely different way that you deal with, uh, with such individuals. Uh, these books, they teach you how to deal with normal, regular people, right? So uh, someone who doesn't have very good um, Usually they have personality disorders of one sort or another. There are people like this. Um, so it's general, average, everyday uh, methods of communication don't work with such individuals. Um, just make dua, you don't get married to one. Uh, it, is, it is extremely difficult to communicate with such an individual. So this is also something that should come up in your homework phase. So when you are researching someone, and when you are finding out about their background, if it comes up that you know this person has, uh, you know, um, when you speak to them about their family and you ask, okay, do you have any aunts or uncles? Yes, I do, but we don't speak to any of them. Okay, that's that's not necessarily always a bad thing. Uh, it's uh, you know it's not a complete write-off, but th this is uh, you know uh, something that should go off in your mind that you know why does this person not have a relationship with anyone in his extended family? There could be a valid and good reason for that. If there is, that's perfectly fine. Then you ask them about their relationship with other friends. If they don't have any friends, right? If they don't have any friends, or then this is also a problem, that how can somebody grow up and have no friends? Right? Is there anyone sitting inside this room that can tell me that they don't have a single friend? Okay? <laughs> so most people are not like that. Right? So this should also be a red flag for you. But okay, and the, uh, in, in this book at the back, and I will share the, the PDF with the So this is the entire book at the back in the appendix. There are those hundred questions, uh, but uh, uh, I will also share those hundred questions with them, say, inshallah, and you can uh, share it in your groups. Um, some of them are, uh, you know, I don't entirely agree with the way that they are phrased, but uh, generally the questions are good questions. So they also have uh, to deal with how someone deals with, uh, you know, the interpersonal conflict in their life. So just, you know, at work, um, in their family, amongst friends. And if you notice that somebody doesn't particularly do conflict well, so if there's like, you know, a whole uh, list of uh, 56 different people that they don't speak to for 56 different reasons, then that's a red flag, right? That this is something that, um, th this is something that should worry you, that this person doesn't do conflict very well. So um, then this person is also not going to do conflict very well after they get married. So this is something that, uh, that you should be concerned and worried about. But generally speaking, um, the first step to to sustaining a marriage is to develop open lines of communication. Open line. So you know, I could sit here and tell you that oh, you know, uh, you need to uh, show ge grand gestures every week, and you know, you need to buy flowers for your wife, and you know, you need to buy chocolates on Valentine's Day, and you know, you need to do. Uh, don't do that. By the way, Valentine's Day is hard. But uh, this is. Uh, uh, I could tell you to do all of these things, but these are these are not the the source of conflict in most people's marriage. The source of conflict is that there's a deterioration in the way that they communicate, and this is what leads to their conflict, and this is what needs to be fixed. Okay, and uh, um, you begin by trying to fix this in house. Always, you always try and fix your problem in house first. So you attempt to try and deal with it yourself. If that doesn't work. Right? If, that, if after genuinely trying to fix this problem that doesn't work, then and only then you seek the counsel of a third party who is neutral. 
you know, for the for the sake of Allah, someone who is neutral. So many things they go south because you ask the wrong people. So if you, as a husband, go and ask your mother or your father for advice, and you, as a wife, you go and ask your mother or your father for advice, they're probably going to side with you. I would, you know, if my son came and asked me for advice, I would probably side with him. It's just natural for one to side with with their son or their daughter. So you want to seek the advice of a neutral third party. And I've men I mentioned this in, the, in the, the marriage seminar as well, that don't take marriage advice from your close friends. Very, very terrible people to seek marriage advice from. So this is uh, sisters, brothers, um, they're good people to you know, have dinner with, good people to you know, have coffee with, good people to go to the park with, good people to, you know, to, to bounce random ideas off of, not good people to advise you on your marital life. This is a huge problem in, in many newly wed couples, that you know, the, the moment something, something um, happens in their marriage, they would go to their friends for advice. First of all, it's quite possible that half of those guys or girls are not even married anyways. So what possible advice can they give you that's going to fix your problem if they have never if they have never been in that situation? Okay? You can read all of these books ten times, and until you actually haven't been in the thick of things, that you're not going to know how to deal with this effectively. And the second thing is obviously they are your friends. They are they are going to be biased towards you. They're going to not give you a very good advice. Um, you know, generally they're going to. Uh, they're going to give you the sort of advice that you would tend to expect from them. You know, they want to see you win. So, you know, it's, it's like a lawyer, right? So in the world of, uh, of uh, conflict, there are two ways to deal with conflict. One is that, you know, the traditional way where, you know, one side gets a lawyer, the other side gets a lawyer. What is the lawyer's interest? The lawyer wants to see their client win. Your friends are your advocates and your lawyers. They want to see you win and the other party lose. They may not say it like that, but that's, that's what they want to see. And that's going to be detrimental for your marriage. So you need to seek the advice of a neutral third party. This could be an elder in your family. Uh, this could be um, someone, uh, an elder in the community. This could be an imam. This could be a therapist. Um, but somebody who is, who is known to deal with, uh, with such problems, right? So it's... It, like some people, they you know, uh, there is this issue in the community of people going to uh, you know random. Uh, so not every imam, right? So I'm going to speak about imams first because I'm an imam. Not every imam is is qualified to deal with marital conflict. Period. So if you go to them and you seek their advice, they may be able to give you a hadith or two about marital conflict, but they will not be able to help you deal with your conflict. Because this is not this is not something that they are trained in. This is not something that they are experienced in, and this is not the person that you should ask. You should ask this person how to correct your tajweed. You should ask this person about the Quran and Sunnah. And you should ask about all of these things. Um, if this person is not the person who has experience and training in dealing with marital conflict, this is not the person that you should ask that for. There are so many cases where people's conflict could have been mitigated, but due to the, the involvement of certain uh, individuals from within the community, well-intentioned many times, but inexperienced, they, the conflict tends to get worse in that marriage, and uh, oftentimes it leads to divorce. So you only go outside if there is a problem that even after attempting to do this genuinely in-house, you were unable to solve. And after this, inshallah, uh, next week we will be, uh, so not next week, in like two days, so on Friday, uh, we will be talking about the final uh, topic on this, uh, um, in this course, and that is the topic of talaq, uh, in particular as it pertains to Muslims living in the West, inshallah. So there are obviously the sharahi rulings of divorce, and uh, it becomes a little more complicated when you, when you pair those with uh, um, the civil laws of, of this country. Um, or this province, so how the, the interplay between these two things is what we will be focusing on on, on Friday, inshallah. So, Jazakumullah khairan for being here on, on a Wednesday night.